Hello folks, I'm Mr. Pinolo. Today in front of me, I have three containers of water and I'm going to drink each of these containers of water as fast as I can. However, there's a little bit of a twist. I'm gonna use three different straws, like the ones that you see on the table in front of you. The first straw that I'll use is a coffee stirrer, this black straw. It is very, very thin. The second straw is this yellow straw. This is about a standard one that you might use at home or in a restaurant. The third straw is this crazy straw that is really long and has a very big opening. Let's take a look at the effect that each straw has on the time that it takes me to drink the liquid. We'll start first with the coffee stir. Three, two, That took a lot of work. It took a while for me to drink the water using the coffee stir. Now let's use the standard straw on our second cup. Three, two, one. Still took a while, but much faster than the previous example. Now let's move on to our third container of water where we'll use the big straw. Three, two, one. Pretty quick. In fact, I was also watching how many gulps of water that I took. This last container with the big straw, I only needed four gulps to get all the water in. However, the coffee stir took much longer. You can go back and time me if you wanted to in the videos, but I think it's pretty safe to say that using the coffee stir or the thin straw took me the longest amount of time, whereas using this thick, funny straw took the shortest amount of time. So why would I do that? Why would I spend time in the beginning part of our educational video, drinking three containers of water as fast as I could. Well, the reason I'm doing that is to model a new physics term to you. That term is resistance. Resistance means something that is preventing something from happening. For example, maybe you could turn up the resistance on a stationary bicycle that you're using and that would make it harder to pedal. Each of the straws made it harder for me to drink the water quickly. However, the thin black coffee stir made it really difficult for me to drink the water quickly. There was a lot of resistance in that straw. Whereas the blue straw that was very thick, there was not a lot of resistance. It made it very easy for me to drink the water quickly. This same thing is true in a circuit. If you have something that has a lot of resistance, it will make it very difficult for the electric current or the electrons to flow. Whereas if you have something that has very low resistance, it makes it very easy for electrons to flow. And certain factors can affect the resistance of wires and other circuitry elements. Let's transition now and have a look at resistors which provide resistance in an electric circuit. Here is an incomplete circuit on your screen. Right now, if I connect the wires of this circuit, the battery goes on fire. Why? This is a complete circuit and we can see the electrons flowing through it. The problem is the electrons are moving much too fast right now. And so to slow the electrons down to a safe level, pretty much every circuit needs to have a bit of resistance to it. Now I can do that in one of two ways. The first way is that I could put something inside the circuit. This device that you see here outlined in yellow is a resistor. They sell these kinds of things at stores. You can buy them to put inside of circuits. 
and they serve to slow the current down. Just like the coffee stirrer slowed down the time that it took me to drink the water. Now, when I connect the wires here, you will notice that the current is able to flow. But thanks to the presence of the resistor, it takes much longer for the current to travel through the circuit. And therefore, the amount of electric current is less. Now, did you know that a resistor is not the only device that you can put in a circuit to slow it down? Technically, light bulbs have their own amount of internal resistance. They have a little bit of resistance built into them. So notice when I connect this circuit, the battery does not go on fire. That's because the light bulb has some resistance. Notify if I hit values here, I see the resistance of the light bulb. This particular light bulb has a resistance of 10. More specifically, 10 ohms, as we'll talk about in just a second. That has the same effect as if I were to put a regular resistor like I showed you earlier that has a resistance of 10 ohms. Notice they both serve to slow down the current in the circuit. That's the job of any good resistor. So let's get back to our circuit. Although you might be looking at this circuit saying, Mr. Panola, what's going on now? There's no resistor. So shouldn't your nine volt battery be on fire? Well, even though that might seem reasonable, you may have missed a small change that I made over here on the right side of the screen. Do you see where it says wire resistivity? Wires themselves can have resistance meaning that it's just hard for electric current to pass through any wire. Pretty much any wire that you're going to encounter in real life has a little bit of resistance to it. Usually not enough to significantly slow down the current in a circuit. But notice as I turn wire resistivity up, the current slows down. If I were to bring wire resistivity down to a tiny amount, I would indeed set the battery on fire and the current will be going too fast because there would not be enough resistance in the, in the wires. These wires that you're seeing on the screen are very good conductors. They have very little resistance. We therefore call them superconductors because their resistance is so low. So let's now get back to wires that have a little bit of resistance to them. I could increase the resistance of the wire just by turning up this dial. But let's look a little bit closer at what kinds of things affect how much resistance would be in the wires. There are four factors that we need to know about that will affect how much resistance a certain wire has. Let's discuss them now on the board. So we just said there are four factors that affect the resistance of a wire. The first thing you saw in the demonstration that I started this video off with, and that is the thickness. If you have a thicker wire, just like when I had the really thick, thick straw, it allows current to flow very easily. On the other hand, if you have a very thin wire, just like the very thin coffee stirrer, it does not allow current to flow easily and therefore would have a lot of resistance. So thickness would have a, an inverse relationship with resistance. That is to, that, to say that as thickness goes up, resistance goes down. Our very thick straw had a lot less resistance than the very thin coffee stir. That's because the thick straw allowed water to flow more easily, just like a thick wire would allow electrons to flow more easily. If you want a material to have very little resistance, that material should be very The second factor that affects the resistance of a wire is length. Have you ever seen someone try to drink a 
a drink using a crazy straw that wraps around their head. If you have a straw that's very long, it will definitely cause you to take much longer to drink whatever you're having. The same thing is true with wires. If a wire is very long, it will be very hard for the electric current to flow through it. Therefore, we say that length has a direct relationship with resistance. As the length of the wire goes up, the resistance goes up as well. That's because a longer wire makes it harder for the electric current to pass. So if you wanted to create a wire that has very low resistance, that wire ought to be very short. The third factor that affects resistance is one that might seem a little odd, and that is temperature. Did you know that something is ver that is very cold actually allows current to flow very easily? That's because when something is hot, all the molecules are bouncing around, and therefore it makes it very tough for the electric current to pass through. Think about a room where a lot of people are constantly moving around. It's very hard for someone to walk from one end of that room to the other because everybody is bouncing around and getting in your way. But when molecules are very stationary and not moving very fast, it's much easier for the electric current to flow. And so therefore, we say that temperature would have a direct relationship with resistance. As the temperature goes up, there is a lot more resistance in the wires. Technically, it is a lot harder for electric current to flow when wires are very hot because the molecules are bouncing around and colliding with each other more, making it harder for the electrons to pass through. So when the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up. Therefore, if you wanted to create a wire that had very low resistance, that wire should be very cold and kept at a very low temperature, as close to absolute zero or zero Kelvin as you can get. The last factor which affects the resistance of a wire is actually the material that the wire is made out of. Now we can't really classify this as inverse or direct, but we can say this, certain materials are much better at conducting electricity than other ones. You may have noticed from our recent activity with, that we did in class with electric current that most metals are very good electrical conductors. They're very good at allowing current to flow through them. On the contrary, some materials like rubber, plastic, and wood, and even air, are not very good at allowing current to pass through them. So if you wanted to create something that has a lot of resistance, you should use a material that is not a very good conductor. For example, a piece of rubber would have a lot of resistance to it, so much so that current would basically not be able to flow through the circuit. But if you use a material that is an excellent electrical conductor, that means that current will be able to flow through that material very easily. Copper, or most metals, would be an example of something like that. And that's why most wires are made out of copper, because copper has a very low resistance. If you wanted to create something that has a very low resistance, you should make sure that you choose a material that would allow current to flow through very easily. There is technically a scientific word for this. So rather than saying material, we are going to say the resistivity of the material. Substances like copper and other metal would have a resistivity value that is very low, and therefore it would allow current to flow through 
very easily. Action one. So what's the best kind of resistor? Well, in a lot of cases, people want wires that do not have a lot of resistance to them. They want to them to be especially good conductors. In science, we have a name for those things. We call them superconductors. Or in other words, materials that are so good at conducting electricity, they have barely any resistance to them. Superconductors, based on what we just learned, should be very thick. Just like my thick straw, which allowed the water to flow through very easily. They should also be very short. Remember, longer wires have more resistance. Also, they should be kept at a very cold temperature. Because the higher the temperature is, the more the molecules bounce around. A superconductor, something would, that would have a very low resistance, would be very cold. And it should be made out of a material that has a very low resistivity. So it would probably be made out of metal, such as copper or other types of metal. If you have these four factors, a material that's very thick, very short, very cold, and made out of metal, then it might be trending towards becoming a superconductor. And superconductors, like we mentioned, have very low resistance. These kinds of materials allow electric current to flow very, very easily. Before we wrap up, let's talk about resistance in terms of equations. Do you know the symbol which represents resistance in an equation? The symbol makes a lot of sense. It's just simply a capital R. Electric current was a capital I, which is a little bit of a strange choice. But resistance makes a lot of sense. You would show the resistance of something just by writing a capital R. The SI unit for resistance, however, is an odd one. If you were to measure resistance, you would likely use this unit. The Greek letter omega, or in other words, ohms. Ohms are a unit that's named after Georg Ohm, a German scientist. We'll talk more about Mr. Ohm in a couple videos. But for now, you should know that resistance will be measured in ohms. Therefore, I can say that the resistance of a resistor or a light bulb is, let's say, 10 ohms. Notice I did not write ohms equals 10. I didn't write R equals 10 without a unit. This is how I would express the resistance of something, especially if I were to be doing a calculation. Thanks for watching today, and I hope you learned something about resistance. Remember, a resistor makes it difficult for electric current or electrons to flow in a circuit. If you have a resistor that has a very low resistance, it is called a superconductor and is likely very short, very thick, very cold, and made out of metal. We're going to be looking at resistors in our next couple of videos and seeing how they affect the current in various types of electric circuits. Take care.